Well, in, to put it succinctly, I had radically changed my diet very fast. That was one of the contributing factors. My blood pressure meds, which I have taken for a long time, um, uh, plummeted and at, at a concentric point, they, they hit that, that point. And, um, you know, I, I, um, I got weak and dizzy and, um, and then when you're in this building and it happens, they take you to the hospital. I, as I was being wheeled out in the gurney, I was joking with him. Um, you know, and it was, somebody asked me what would have happened if I was home alone. I would have just slept it off and woken up and gone to the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, I certainly hope there's not, no more events in my life. Um, I, you know, I'm certainly not one of the, the, the kind of person that uh, one would expect to have a massive pulmonary embolism. It turns out that I have a genetic predisposition to this that I learned about through this. So that means that I'm going to be taking blood thinners. Um, but for the most part, my life will go back to normal. I'm about 80% right now. And what that means for those of you that don't know me very well is it means I'm not running mountains and going out dancing at night and running the stairs in the building right now, um, which is what sort of my normal operating, you know, um, uh, lifestyle is so uh, but I'm you know I'm back at work full-time I was here until 830 last night uh, doing the business for the people of district 16 so um, I hope to be back running in the next uh, three or four weeks so that's that's my status so representative Gunberg you're saying it's not his pie that caused it <laughs> you know I, I I told him it was for a number of days until I finally admit it wasn't his pie. Okay, that's too bad. <laughs> uh, this is a, okay, so the real question is, um, the AARP seems to be upping the ante on the smoking bill. They sent out a, a letter last night. They didn't name the chair of the House Rules, but said, identified the, the chair of the, as the House, of the House Rules as the person who's holding this thing up and urged the House majority or the Speaker to put some pressure to, to bring that bill. What's going on with that bill? Oh, we've, um, I think uh, I can speak for myself. I've spoken to the chair. Uh, I've said I support the bill because I think uh, second hand smoke kills people. Um, and uh, banning smoking indoors is a smart thing to do. But not everybody agrees. Uh, um, you know, there are some interesting provisions of that bill. I, uh, they haven't, uh, I don't know, uh, I can't speak for uh, the member who's holding the bill. Um, I think it should pass personally. So what are you doing about it? Besides speaking to the chair, speaking to the chair what are you doing to pass this bill? I have, yeah, yeah, I, I've, I've co-prime sponsored the bill, um, and um, I have spoken to the chair and asked her to allow a vote on it. The rules chair has the, has always had the power, and I know that as a prior victim of prior rules chairs, they have held my bills for many, many, many months. Uh, Representative Johnston would hold bills, uh, Representative Rokeberg would hold bills. It's been the tradition in this building. I, uh, I think the bill should pass, I, but you know, all of us are one vote. Just to follow up on that, you can move to discharge and there's more than 21 co-sponsors of that bill in the house right now. It's a potential option. Uh, Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Uh, Representative Gary, your opioid prescription uh, information uh, bill is, uh, I think, up today in House Finance. Um, and uh, I was interested in, A, uh, what you hope this would accomplish, and B, what your response would be to a doctor who might be concerned about legislators getting into the practice of medicine. Yeah, the bill is legislators getting into the practice of making sure patients have full information about the addictive dangers of opioids. Um, uh, we have many doctors who are doing the right thing, uh, many prescribers, it's not just doctors who prescribe, who tell their patients that opioids are potentially addictive. Um, we have a, a higher than the national average death rate from opioid overdoses in the state. Um, we have a higher prescription rate for, for opioids in the state. And the Federal Centers for Disease Control has recognized nationally 
that there's still enough prescribers who are not telling their patients about the dangers of opioids that they've adopted guidelines and said, you should tell them about the dangers of opioids. You should tell them that there are sometimes alternatives to opioids so they can make an informed decision. And so parents can tell their own children about these dangers. What we don't need is more people addicted to prescription drugs in the state. 80% of those people who use heroin started out on opioid and other painkiller prescriptions. That's an alarming fact. Um, you know, I learned about the dangers of opioids by sitting in a hearing here. Um, we should be learning that from our prescribing medical providers. And so the bill follows the CDC model. Uh, it follows the model of a number of other states that are asking their prescribers to provide information to their patients. You know, it's not good enough to give people that crumbled piece of paper that comes with your prescription. People don't read that. Uh, um, and most doctors, we had powerful testimony from an emergency room doctor, Ann Zink, at Matsu Regional Hospital. And Ann Zink uh, is, is a very bright woman, and she said she recognizes uh, that many physicians and others are not telling their patients about the dangers of opioids. I never was every any time I was prescribed them. Um, and, and Dr. Zink and her emergency doctors group, they've actually, they're taking action to, to make sure that they do advise their patients of the dangers of opioids. It's not a hard thing. The bill is very uh, relaxed. It says a doctor should advise people in their own words. You know, not a lot of words. They don't have to read a script. You know, it's a 30-second conversation. I, you, you know, know I'll I'm just... going to expand on that on my prescription drug uh, manager's bill. Um, when we start talking and understanding the relationship between uh, uh, pharmacists and um, the PBMs and the state and and everybody, you start realizing that it is not just the doctor, it is the prescription drug manager, it's the distributors, it's the manufacturers. It's a vertical chain that affects how things are prescribed. And Representative Guerra's bill focuses on that point, but it's a part of a larger issue that is systemic in this in, in delivering of medicine. Yeah, I also want to point out that, you know, uh, medical, uh, Medical providers uh, are responsible first to the Hippocratic Oath, which is, you know, do no harm. And um, if uh, if they're not uh, making their patients aware of the fact that opioids have this particular, particularly you know, very high risk of addiction, then they're actually contributing to it. And it, it's, it's really irresponsible. Most of the best practitioners these days are being, are being really frank about that. But, um, you know, if we need to introduce legislation to keep Alaskans from becoming addicted to opioids, which are in many cases entirely unnecessary for the, the treatment of pain, then, um, the, then that's what we're going to do. And I'll just point out that, you know, I just went through a massive pulmonary embolism and I never took one opioid. I'm taking Tylenol, over-the-counter Tylenol, and it worked perfectly fine for, you know, what is a very painful condition. And I think that, you know, we just need to be having a frank conversation about it. And I thank Representative Guerra for introducing this bill. I just need to say, follow up. This is not, this is not a joke. In Indiana, um, they have their highest number of youth in foster care because of the opioid epidemic. We have people dying daily. 93 people a day die from opioid overdoses in the state, heroin and opioid over overdoses in the state. It is a crisis not just here, but I was out of the country. It's a world crisis right now. It's a national crisis. It's an Alaska crisis that's costing us a lot of money and a lot of lives. And um, just to make sure that everyone gets a chance to <laughs> make a at least a brief comment about the opioid crisis. There's a number of topics and areas to approach the opioid crisis. Representative Gary's, Gary's bill is one of them. None, no one will fix the challenge and fix the problem. On a national level, we've seen since 1999 where the drug overdose deaths are almost four times the homicide rate. And when you see the graph, you realize that the opioid challenges and the challenges that our society faces through the opioid epidemic are not going away. This bill is one, one possible step, but it doesn't solve the problem. It's going to take a huge effort on the part of the commu of communities across the country to address the opioid crisis, and it's a challenge each day and every day. Um, Steve Quinn, KTVA News. This is for Representative Clayman. Um, you spoke about a couple bills that uh, you're giving um, a credence to. Uh, what about the governor's um, uh, pretrial bill? 
Uh, the governor has a number of different bills in his public safety action plan. We'll be hearing later this week the bill regarding background checks for police officers and training. We've already heard last week the governor's bill for the attorney general for controlled substances in the Senate is already working on the out-of-state conviction matters that you're addressing. So all that is being addressed by the legislature here in the Capitol. Rich Marigan, Channel 2 News. Uh, I think, uh, Representative Gary, you described, this is going back to the budget, if that's okay. Um, I think you said, this, you, you said the Senate had deficit budgets. Uh, the implication is that you guys don't. But isn't, isn't your budget, isn't every budget by its nature a deficit budget, except that the Constitution says you can't have a deficit budget, so that you're just spending savings. It's just a different pot of savings. Uh, the House passed over a plan that would have eliminated all of those deficits last year and allowed us to move forward on education, allowed us to move forward with the university, allowed us to move forward to protect seniors, allowed us to move forward to protect children, and allowed us to bolster our, our crime prevention staff, which is prosecutors and police and troopers. It would have eliminated the deficit. Uh, a big part of it would have been a, 20, a simple 25% tax only on those oil companies that make profits. We have the lowest oil tax rate uh, in the nation for any major oil producing state. Um, and giving away your oil money at the same time that your deficit spending because you don't want to get Alaskans a fair share for their oil does not make sense. So we passed, you know, a fiscal plan you don't want to hit the poorest people the hardest, and our caucus has said that it has to be balanced. So those born with privilege, uh, those with great wealth, those corporations with massive wealth should also chip in. Um, uh, you know, we should do more than just class warfare in this building. And, uh, but we could not get that past many of our more conservative colleagues. We can only vote as we vote. I have one vote. Representative Sponholtz has one vote. If the public has elected legislators who say that we should live with deficit spending, there are two houses in this legislature. Uh, we hope we can come together. I've proposed an idea that would make it easy to come together. Uh, but if folks are going to sort of stand in their corners and, and stick with their positions, we can't stop the Senate from deficit spending. So I want to follow up on that a little bit as well. Um, you know, there, there's, I, I, would, I still think that there is a pretty strong distinction between the Senate's plan and the House's plan. The House has passed a comprehensive fiscal plan. We passed, passed a fiscal plan that would balance our budget in good oil prices and bad oil prices, in, in high, um, high um, you know, stock markets and low stock markets last year. And we've said very clearly that we're not willing to deficit spend over the long term. We don't believe that that's responsible. Uh, you know, how it is that we, get, we navigate through that with a Senate who would like to uh, implement a permanent fund only plan and just drain our savings away, I'm not in, it's not entirely clear to us right now. We're continuing to navigate this. We have an iterative you know, budget, pro uh, budget process and legislative process which requires that the House and the Senate work together but um, you know we're really clear that we don't want to be draining our savings I'm concerned right now that this is going to be the first year that the state of Alaska has ever looked to the permanent fund earnings reserve to fund government this is deeply concerning for me it's deeply concerning for me for a couple of reasons. One is I think it jeopardizes the dividend over the long term, which is really important to the state of Alaska. We have the smallest amount of uh, income difference in the state of Alaska between our poorest and our richest, and a big part of that is the permanent fund dividend, which is really important to a lot of working people. Um, and the second is that if we burn through the earnings reserve, essentially we're robbing today's permanent fund uh, from tomorrow's children, right? The value of the fund has the fund has to grow over time, or else we're sort of robbing our children of their uh, fair share of our resource wealth, and that's what the permanent fund is. And so I'm deeply concerned about this, and I, I don't think that it's responsible to just say that we're going to hope that oil prices continue to grow up. We know that predictions are that they're not going to move out of this sort of mid 60s range for a very long time because of shale oil production. Uh, both in the lower 48 and nationally, um, it's, it's, it's just not a good strategy. Well, yeah, real, real quick follow-up. So, so your, is your budget, would it be affected by if Senate Bill 176 should happen to pass, 
It seems that uh, you're over the $4.1 billion limit in that appropriations. So, so I've, I've been here long enough that I can't. What, what's seven about 176? <laughs> The spending cap? The spending cap, yeah. yeah. Uh, l we shouldn't do artificial budgeting, right? If you, have, if you have children who need teachers, you should provide teachers, right? We're, we're over 1,000 teachers and educators down compared to five years ago. Class sizes are growing up, are, are going up. If that's the society you want, you're gonna see people leave the state. That's not the Alaska I believe in. I don't believe in an Alaska where people look, see no commitment to public education, see no commitment to a fiscal plan, see no commitment to responsible budgeting, and say, I'm leaving the state, I'm out of here. There are businesses that are not moving up here because they know we have an unsustainable fiscal plan, and they don't know what the future fiscal plan is going to be, so they're not coming up here. Um, it is harming our economy very badly to sort of stand by and say, you know, let's just play roulette with oil prices. If they go to $40 a barrel, yeah, we're out of money. Well, I guess that's too bad. That's not a fiscal plan. We've heard, let me just jump in here. We hear many times that government should be run like a business and you wouldn't do that. The problem is no business would run the state like we're doing it, what they want to do. No business would risk and sell all of its assets and savings down to zero, which is what the Senate wants to do. No business would destabilize itself, uh, you know, for, um, uh, for one hand for the other. We need to just have a fiscal plan that stabilizes the state's economy. Um, uh, but we need to act responsibly, and we put our necks on the line last year when we put a plan on the table, and we're waiting for the Senate to come to reason to have something on the table that we can, we can deal with them back and forth to balance the state economy. We've already heard over the years, uh, the past few years, about corporations that aren't investing in Alaska because we don't have a stable fiscal plan. We don't have a sound economic policy. And then at some point, when we follow the Senate's path, crashes the economy and then does something. That's completely irresponsible. I'd also like to point out that a $4.1 billion budget is, would, re, would require hundreds of millions of dollars of cuts, which the public has said they've pretty much seen enough cuts. We, uh, you know, we're now trying to reinstore, reinstate some of, the, some of the cuts to public safety, which have caused havoc throughout the state of Alaska. And in the, you know, in, we have basic public safety uh, services, which are no longer being provided right now. We're no, longer you know, we're no longer testing water in rural Alaska right now. We're no longer inspecting Expecting kitchens outside of outside of local municipalities that can afford that. We're, we're threatening basic health and safety at this point in time. I don't know where you're going to get that those hundreds of millions of dollars from. And on top of that, ICER very clearly showed in their analysis a few years ago that for every hundred million dollars of cuts, we're talking about losing 1,200 jobs in a state that by the end of this year is going to lose close to 12,000 jobs in the last few years. I, I just don't see risking that for you know for our state. So we have a meeting in here. Uh, yesterday we asked the Senate where negotiations stand on some kind of permanent fund draw because the session will not end until there's some kind of permanent fund draw, I'm assuming. Given that the Senate has rejected the income tax idea or the idea of taxes, what would it take to get you guys, each of you to vote yes on a permanent fund draw? Uh, we're not going to draw a line in the sand. Uh, I think we feel very comfortable with our co-chairs of finance um, you know, many of us are on the leadership team, and many of the good many good ideas are coming from the whole caucus. We're not drawing lines in the sand. Uh, we don't want to poison the well, or else we will never get out of this session. So uh, I think we're standing willing and ready to work with the Senate, but not drawing lines in the sand.